um, not only that, it's the source of the most uh, permanent and, and uh, sort of perverse pollution in London that still today exists, both in the river as well as in the air. Because it was a coal, uh, 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 a coal uh, uh, fired uh, uh, energy plant uh, that for I don't know how many years, uh, 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 close to from 45 to 68, um, uh, uh, produced the most extraordinary level of pollution in a climate that, as you know, has very low clouds and very uh, uh, sort of damp weather. And, and so the level of pollution in practically the whole area of center London is basically due to uh, this object, which is now supposed to be great. Um, it has another couple of uh, statistical notes to make. It's the largest chimney in one piece of concrete ever built. The problem is that the uh, reinforcing of the concrete is being corrupted by 25 years of pollution, so the, the chimneys are, <clears throat> are in a process of natural self-destruction. I mean, you know, the, the whole place is, is uh, guarded now because, you know, every so often a piece of concrete just falls. Um, uh, but this organization, which is called English Heritage, which has gone through, like all organizations, through different levels of quality in terms of its guidance and governance, um, uh, has uh, forced this developer to uh, rebuild the station, which suffer a number of different changes. Not only just, uh, it, you know, it, it doesn't have a roof anymore, it lacks half of the walls, the chimneys are uh, being, uh, as I say, they have to be replaced with the same method of construction. So the chimneys alone cost 35 million pounds, which is Seventy million dollars uh, just to replace uh, um, uh, the structure of it. The total setup, I mean, uh, uh, rehab of the building, bringing it to what it was even before putting the roof on it, uh, is a, is a hit of 185 million pounds, which is 300 million dollars. And then you have to start developing, and then all of this is where the coal was uh, stored. And then remediation of this land is another in extraordinary expensive proposition and so on. Enough with this one. Uh, I just want a, a, um, a brief comment on this, which is in, this is the Brooklyn project. It's, a, it's, a, um, it's called the uh, Domino Sugar Factory. Um, uh, you, you probably have used these sachets of, of, of sugar. Um, this was the place where, um, uh, where the building um, uh, uh, of, of the storage and the refinery of the, the, of, uh, of the sugar was located. So all of this is in, in, in essence an absolutely gigantic machine that uh, uh, brings the syrup up, up to this point and, and, and the, then brings it, down, brings it down through a series of uh, chutes in here. The thing is packed or was packed in here and then stored in this very long, one mile long uh, warehouses where the barges would come and distribute. Uh, the interesting thing, is not that I'm interested in the production of sugar, is that the place is once again an extraordinary source of uh, pollution. Uh, it costs $85 million to dismantle the interior of the building just to be able to think about using it. But the most extraordinary part of this is that this is the highest concentration of Orthodox Jewish community in New York City. Um, is the whole area here surrounding this is is just is just the you you see all these guys with the black stuff and the curls and all of that all over the, the and they 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 have this sort of kind of incredible sense of respect, which as I say is always from far. Um, and uh, at the beginning of this project, I wanted to, of course, like the developers, see if we could actually not go through this one and see if we could demolish it. It was landmarked just to oppose this thing and heralded as one of the most important buildings in, in depicting the history of industrial New York 
uh, and kept uh, uh, um, alive. Um, and then just as a in, uh, as a as an exercise, I I I really when I when we thought that we were losing the the chance of demolishing it, um, I did some further analysis on on the history of the building. And the building was a building prefabricated um, uh, that was bought in Germany and brought in barges uh, and built around the factory. Um, but the curious thing, which is uh, a little bit of a secret because I've been sworn not to say it, but I mean, since I'm in Michigan, um, <laughs> the same, I saw that there was something very peculiar about the arches in the building because they are completely, they are the same arches but all on different dimensions and so on. And, and uh, the, what I discovered, which of course is uh, private information, confidential, is that the same builder that built this building is the builder that built Auschwitz. And uh, so this building is, and if you walk inside of the building, you see, if you recall the, the this absolutely horrific images of Auschwitz, uh, this building is absolutely full of it. In the cracks in the center of the Orthodox Jewish community in Manhattan. And this, the preservation people have essentially demonstrated that this is a, a piece of architecture that needs to be um, maintain. Uh, the project is located here. I'm, I'm going to start with this. Uh, and it's an extraordinary uh, long uh, uh, frontage of the, uh, of, the, uh, 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 of, the, of the East River. Um, it is at the point of closest relationship between the two shores. And we won this competition because I propose something that now seems to well, of course, I lost it in the first 10 minutes, but uh, um, that I still think it was great. This is Hudson Street, which is uh, uh, what defines practically the division between uh, uh, two very important neighborhoods in Manhattan and a very large thoroughfare. When you come from the FDR, you take this road and you cross the island very clearly. And this is a, a very important Brooklyn street that leads to this connection, which is the thoroughfare. This is the, the uh, uh, BQE, which is links to the airports and so on. So the first thing I proposed was that uh, I thought that it was a great opportunity to put a, a, a pedestrian bridge in here, such that this distinction between the two neighbors uh, could start uh, sort of being diluted in a way. Um, uh, and it wasn't a very expensive proposition. I mean, the whole project cost less than demolishing the building. Um, but it was uh, almost impossible to convince people that this actually generated a condition of use that could actually change not only the waterfront in Brooklyn, but also this whole area, which is, as I say, very promising and very important. I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the architect, the architect, sorry, the artists that are located in Chelsea, uh, that were located in Chelsea, the studios, have all moved to this area uh, because of obvious reasons, and then now they're going to be moved to another area because they're not going to be able to pay the rent. But um, the idea started by the bridge and by a series of blocks that could actually be, uh, again, thought as envelopes within which different architects could actually come up with um, uh, uh, with different types of solutions. The bridge is uh, uh, is the Manhattan Bridge, and is, it, from an engineering point of view, is one of the worst design bridges in in New York. <laughs> and, um, and not only that, it was all designed with um, steel plates. So uh, at six o'clock in the evening, when the traffic moves from Manhattan to Brooklyn, and in the morning, this thing is like a symphony orchestra, which is I. I think something I shouldn't mention here either, right? But uh, it's, a, uh, it's, it's, it's really the noisiest structure that I've ever seen in my life. No, the, the, the project is supposed to develop in that area. These are the arches that I mentioned. I don't know if this tells you anything. Um, and we started with a very obvious set of rules. I mean, trying to extend the grid to a, a, a park, uh, in, uh, a waterfront park, uh, extending the streets. 
but the only uh, really quite interesting part of it is this comparison between what the city planning commission is forced to um, implement, which is a series of abstract volumes within that basically give you buildings in themselves, um, that uh, uh, is the only one for which the legal structure of the zoning resolution uh, um, allows you to debate, which is that since this is private property, common good, I mean the, the public, could only control setback and total bulk, and, um, and, and this is the, the tools that you have to do buildings with, which is uh, uh, really rather limiting. <coughs> um, the approach that I must say it was embraced by the Planning Commission simply because it was a single ownership and because we went to, uh, through the whole approach of doing it as a, as a um, <clears throat> special permit, was to develop something that would enable us to evolve this thing from your typical forms into this configuration, which is within that envelope, the only thing that we are mandating uh, as a master plan is that all of these other forms that you have here could be divided into a network of modules that by being placed together generate the slab or the tower or the low rise component, but that somehow each of these elements is treated according to each designer and each evolution of it, um, almost in, in whichever way you want. There is no percentage, it's basically a device that allows us to generate a kind of urban form uh, that it responds to the typical typology of these envelopes, but it adds a little bit more than that, gives you a guidance through which, by the breaking of the massing, uh, you generate this notion of, 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 of extrusions that are slender and, and, and much more pleasant. And, uh, and the second regulation is that at the top, these buildings, these extrusions should stop at different heights, so you, the profile of the skyline gets um, uh, more exciting. Um, uh, with the big uh, um, uh, building here, we, the only thing we could do was to open it to create fa community facilities and put a building on the top, on perhaps uh, you know, characterized by the only component of the whole project which is worth keeping, which is the, um, uh, uh, the main uh, stack. And these are some drawings of, uh, of, the, um, uh, of, of how we could conceive the development. Uh, and, and we have several different uh, 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 versions of this model as if you had almost a, a kind of an organ or, a, or a, an extrusion system that allows you to imagine different configurations of the, of the, uh, uh, of the towers as the design progresses. For, from, from another perspective, the street and the connection to the park was highly developed and it has been, all of this has been now approved. Uh, again, uh, with some modifications which I find completely contradictory to the, uh, uh, to the spirit of the city. This is a city that is based on the notion of increased density, um, uh, something which uh, uh, the same people that complain are the people that produce that density. Uh, and then density, in the same way than height, has become a topic of discussion. And part of the, the, of the difficulty of the permit process is precisely that these notions are not sufficiently explained by our discipline. Uh, the level of knowledge that people have of urban design uh, is completely uh, contrary to the level of interest they, they have in talking about it. Um, and, and, and that makes for a, for a very difficult uh, exercise. But as you can see, at the foot of the buildings, the facades are also uh, uh, um, uh, you know, one version of it with some idea of solidity, ratios of, uh, uh, of penetrations, uh, 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 and the transition of the, uh, of the elevations to come to the water's edge, and, and these are just pictures of that. So the interest in here was to once again frame this, but at the same time put these very large lofts um, as a background for the um, uh, uh, for the chimney. Uh, uh, this was another 
collective obsession, which was to save the sign, uh, which means literally nothing. By the way, the, this fellow that owned sugar, uh, uh, the sugar company Domino, uh, uh, was a, a, a slave driver. I mean, somebody that was hated by absolutely everybody. I'm a really mean individual, anyhow. Um, <laughs> As a comparison with that one, uh, we have been involved in, uh, uh, in, in another project, which is quite uh, remarkable, which is this, this uh, power bar, uh, uh, the, the Battersea Power Station. Um, this is London. This is the, um, uh, uh, this is the Big Ben. Uh, these are very, this is the, the most prestigious uh, uh, neighborhood in London. This is Chelsea. Uh, uh, this is the Royal Hospital. Uh, Victoria Station is in here. This is 10 minutes from here to here. And this is like if you would have gone to Mars. I mean, you know, it's totally left out. Uh, it has all these bridges and connections, and yet it is perceived as if it was really in, uh, I don't know, in Idaho or a place like that. I mean. It, uh, the site is bound by another viaduct, which runs in this direction, that frames a very lovely uh, uh, park here. Um, uh, this is a national cricket stadium. And as you can see in here, all the basic infrastructure, industrial infrastructure is located here. These are gas tanks. Um, there are very large uh, uh, factory housing in here. It, it, all, the, the flower market and the whole produce market is located in this area. But as you can see, two things have happened, as you will see, two things have happened which are quite extraordinary. The first one is that um, these developers went through a process of three and a half years to try to get uh, a rezoning for this area. Uh, after uh, four different attempts, which were all, once again, completely unfeasible and totally crazy. One wanted to put the, the Chelsea Football Club Stadium in here. Another one wanted to make this thing into a, 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 a Luna Park or a place of entertainment. Um, the latest project had a series of, had a density which was half the density that we achieved and had things that were quite uh, interesting just once again to reflect the status of uh, of our thinking that was that um, at the top of the chimneys there was a restaurant of one table so um, uh, a, a, you would take an elevator inside of the chimneys and there were four tables in the restaurant separated by approximately uh, 600 feet from here to here um, <laughs> And then you would rent this thing in a bubble that you know, reflected the perception of, uh, of the clouds of uh, the plume, which was all pollution. And then you would have dinner with some eight to 10 friends at the top of it. Um, well, of course, it, it really, they couldn't actually get a chef for that. And uh, they, um, that just basically explained the thing. The problem, as I said before, is the building, because the building is, by virtue of its mass, uh, uh, it is much larger than the geometry of the building itself because you need some space to see it. It's absolutely immense. All of this side is essentially um, uh, blind. It has no, no windows, uh, no fenestration, no rust rustication. It's just a, a, a very difficult place. As you can see here, it's just basically a, uh, um, uh, uh, three walls that support the chimneys. And this is where the um, uh, boiler rooms uh, were located and they needed height. Uh, uh, two football fields can be located in here. The question is what do you do with them? Uh, the site is also penalized by the presence of these gas tanks which are uh, in function uh, and there is a regulation in safety which has some circles of potential explosion that limit the use of the, uh, of the site dramatically. This is the garbage plant of the whole uh, uh, city of, uh, of London, and this is the, uh, uh, the largest producer of cement in this city. Um, so these guys, still with some sense of humor, decided that they were actually attempt to do it. Uh, as I say, it took us, this is where the, the remediation needs to occur. All of this was uh, coal, essentially. Um, and, and it is bound by this viaduct, which uh, uh, you know, completely cuts their relationship to the park. 
Um, but you can see in here the level of proximity with central London is an, an extraordinary site that would have been really uh, uh, greatly enhanced by not having this object in the center. Um, in any event, the plan inevitably tended to have a narrative that says that we think the building is great, um, which is uh, in reality not, nothing other than a device to uh, keep separate from it. Um, uh, so there is a novel uh, space that allows you to circulate around. This is a case in which the notion of the grid is completely inapplicable, number one, because uh, London doesn't have a grid. Number two, because there, this is also a viaduct, because this is elevated. So from here to here, it go, goes to grade right when the, when the site ends. So I mean, you know, there is no potential connectivity in here. And to top things up, I mean, uh, uh, the only way to make the project work was to propose an, um, uh, a, a, a new route of, uh, of uh, subway service from Vauxhall, which is located here, which the development has to afford. Um, so the, the project develops around this notion of s large public spaces like this and like that, with buildings that try to follow in, you know, the geometry of the, of the train tracks, but at the same time funnel circulation around three major thoroughfares of access, one which is basically visual, for which uh, uh, this space has been characterized by, by this reflecting pool that brings the water of the, of the, um, uh, uh, of the river uh, back into play uh, down to this area. There is a drop of uh, elevation in this direction, so this is a cascade, so you, when you arrive to the uh, to the only area where you can actually uh, drop off in taxis and so on. Um, uh, you have a view of the station, but you also have a view of the water announcing the presence of this waterfront park at the end. So that's a, the most processional access to the, to the project. The second one is what we call High, High Street, which is a very active um, uh, uh, commercial structure with a lot of retail with the new subway station located into it. So there, there is a two-level access into the main building, which has a, a, a relatively modest amount of uh, retail, enough to support um, a, a, a good portion of residential at the top of the building, commercial big plan uh, areas for uh, uh, Class B office space. And at the base of the building, uh, we are proposing a new power station which takes uh, um, uh, the garbage from this guy here and shoots it into this and use it as fuel to generate the energy for the site. Um, the second idea was this sort of notion of breaking this uh, uh, architecture into a series of new terraces, which is something that is very dear to to, uh, uh, to the London tradition with some, uh, um, uh, uh, there is a hotel and uh, elderly housing, there is a, uh, a hospital located right into the water in an effort to bring people to the water uh, uh, and, and have a look at the, uh, 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 at the, at the river uh, in its limited dimension. This is a very simple park. I mean, this of course couldn't actually be moved either. Uh, uh, is the jetty where uh, the barges used to discharge the coal. So this is a slope area where, uh, where we actually create enough room to, to um, uh, uh, have uh, outdoor tents and uh, events, which is a very typical London thing to do, with a large entry plaza that allows you to go up to a uh, a, a, to a convention center, which also is something of a necessity that London doesn't have. These are some images of the spaces that these buildings generate. Um, uh, that's the uh, a very slow traffic uh, ring around the large building. Uh, uh, we bring the water into it, and this is the level of access to the retail component. The roofs have been transformed into, into uh, uh, public spaces. Uh, that serve these two shoulders of, uh, of, uh, of residential lofts that are located behind 
the chimneys and the, the pediment of the, the chimneys and the uh, uh, and the new components of residential. And then inside of the building, not for any kind of ambition to be respectful of it, but simply because there is no program to fill it, um, we we recreated the two rooms, which are the, are the turbine rooms. I mean, the, the, where the machines were located. Um, and, and, and this is lent to the community. There is a museum of energy incorporated into the project um, and, um, and so on. So I couldn't actually find another definition for this category. <laughs> um, and this is a building in my country of origin uh, in Uruguay. In, um, this wonderful beach that extends from the tip of the entrance into the uh, 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 river plate uh, uh, up to Brazil in this direction. And it's, uh, if you haven't been there, I highly recommend you going because it's really one of the most gorgeous uh, uh, places in the world. There has been a, um, a, a rather uncontrolled development of this area. Uh, um, <coughs> primarily, uh, as I always say, uh, conducted by Argentinians, uh, uh, which have built these uh, horrific towers in here. Um, uh, there was a building existing here, and uh, these developers bought it and wanted to do something very special with it. And the whole idea of the project is this is 45 apartments, each apartment uh, at the top has an average of 10 to 14,000 square feet. And, and all of them have a swimming pool. But if this is a real, real swimming pool. This is, um, uh, uh, what is, 30 meters is 60 feet by 20 feet like this. And, and these swimming pools become the view of these very large maisonettes that step up and sort of try to manage the bulk of the building to the back. Um, so it, it is a, it's a building around a rather stunning house that is part of a complex that becomes a sort of kind of a clubhouse. It has a direct access to the beach under the road and over the road. And it, this is the original concept of it. And as you can see, it's sort of full of penetrations trying to uh, uh, um, avoid the reading of uh, of, uh, of the mass uh, as being too imposing. And so the living rooms are located right on the view to the water, uh, and that's what you see from it. So the sea is uh, extended into your swimming pool, so the notion is that somehow you're part of the same view. It's like every, every one of these houses was a, an independent house, right? Um, the theme is this business of the water, so there is a lot of uh, 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 water that is used for the recirculation of the air conditioning, creating these streams that actually activate, as I say, a place for very expensive and very rich people. So uh, <clears throat> uh, the living rooms are, are uh, unusually high in ceiling height because of the, uh, of the swimming pools. Sorry. And... Um, so that's that. I mean, you know, kind of, it's good, I think. So this is what uh, uh, got us together with Alfred after many years of knowing each other. Um, a building that uh, is part of this whole operation of creating a city center in, in the middle of a place that doesn't have a center. And that, as a matter of fact, is not a city. So laudable as it may be, I think it's completely nuts. <laughs> Not only because of the ambition of it, I mean, creating a city where there is no city, nor the possibility of an extension of a city, but also because of the fact that, of the way in which it was done. And it was done by bringing together um, a group of architects, all with some name. I don't know. I don't know why I'm. <laughs> part of it, but I was really very honored by, by that. And tried to get together into a room as large as this conference room or this uh, auditorium and talk about this idea of the virtual context. Uh, and that tells you how 
ill-conceived, I mean, just the, the whole architectural discourse is, right? So, I mean, there was this, there's nothing more concrete than a context, right? Because it's prior to your action. That's the uh, Western dictionary definition of it. I mean, you come into a context because the context pre-exists. So this idea was um, generated by a friend of ours that uh, had this notion that we could create the context by having architects that the only thing they want is to kill the other guy um, <laughs> and come together in a joint effort to generate a wonderful place. So the result is this thing which is not very different than anything else that occurs in Vegas with one major proviso that it, all of us um, kind of were embarrassed to do Vegas again, not only because it wasn't in the program, I mean the idea wasn't just to reproduce a new city and make it Venetian or make it a Greek or make it a combination of New York City. You probably have seen all of these things, but it, it's really a, an experiment. It's, you, you really need to go with a psychoanalyst, I mean, uh, through the whole experience. But it's a, it's in itself a phenomena which has its rules and works and you know, as I always say, tell me one place where there are 54,000 saxof saxophonists, right? I mean, you know, there are 64,000 people in Vegas that play the saxophone, right? Um, it, it, and it's just uh, absolutely remarkable. And to transform that into a city where the most you can get is probably 150 people playing the saxophone, um, it, it's really a stretch. But, um, the second thing was that there was no floor because all of this is trying to jump over very large roads um, for whoever knows the place. This is really the greatest homage that the country could actually have paid for to one of the most important musicians. This is Frank Sinatra Avenue, um, which I think plays a complete disservice to the memory of this genius, right? <laughs> So this is eight, eight lanes one way, eight lanes the other way, the, the driest and most boring place in the world um, with that name. <clears throat> so there is a, uh, an overpass that comes into this area and then uh, this conversation that occurred there that was uh, attempted, uh, I don't think, more than twice because there was nothing to say because everybody was sort of hiding their own little sketch and not trying to have anything to do with a neighbor, right? And the neighbor was sort of this sort of all of these big shots. I mean, I don't think that Norman showed up more than for one. Um, and uh, but it, w it was everybody, and it was fun, and we had uh, a lot of meals together and so on. Um, but the result is really once again, I think I do think this is incredible. It's one of these things in which. Uh, uh, the, this new version of architecture being a public discussion and being in the, in the media somehow produce something uh, of a certain value. I think some of the buildings are really quite interesting. The problem is that there was no context and still there isn't one. And, uh, and the notion of inventing it together was so uh, obtuse and complicated that uh, the, the, the only thing that ended up having is that each of the buildings become a, 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 uh, a speaker of itself, right? So it, um, knowing that next to us was uh, Caesar and Helmut Young and uh, 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 Danny Liebeskin below and, and a couple of other people that I can't remember now and, and Norman too, I, I thought that the best way, way of dealing with this is to do a calm building. I don't know how calm it ended up being, but you judge it. Um, it's basically a gigantic, an absolutely enormous building that was divided into three layers that are uh, uh, very sculptural in character. One is gray, one is white, and one is black um, uh, that kind of read like this. Now, if you can't believe this, I never understood what Vidara means, but they told me that the V goes for Vignoli, which I suppose I had to be proud of, but uh, I, you know, and all the different projects have this kind of association. So I, I, I purposely asked the photographer to 
really take these pictures outside of the context because I, I think that it's very difficult to make the point otherwise because it really has nothing to do with anything other than the curve of the drop-off in front of Caesar's uh, uh, casino hotel uh, which has 500, 600 rooms. Um, and then it's all about following this, these lines and being, uh, um, you know, to a certain extent spectacular, but uh, uh, trying not to. And, and so you can see it, and it, it gives you, I think, uh, at least when I saw it last, I mean, it gives you um, uh, a, an interesting point. It's the tallest building. It gives you a certain point of reference, and it, it kind of looks uh, all right.